welcome again to uh, to the third days of uh, the third day of this event. Um, and my name is Evaris Kwasikona. I just want to have a very quick, brief uh, introduction before we go uh, into the day. Um, and again, thank you very much to be um, uh, to be here for the first day, for the second day, and then for the third day we uh, today. And um, as you, most of you who have gone through the whole three day um, have noticed that um, each of the day's agenda was totally different. Uh, we started by, you know, the very powerful um, um, opening, um, have the expo when we visit, you know, we sh there's a sharing of uh, many different technology on the first day. And then the second day we went uh, into um, many companies um, and also many organizations to see what they are doing in terms of sanitation. Um, um, and also we asked a lot of questions uh, during the discussion we had uh, with, with, with the partner, with the companies. Um, and then after that, we have a feedback um, that help us basically understand each other and also uh, different company as well um, and what they are doing. And today is more um, the learning day. So um, next slide, the next slide is more the learning day when you want to learn um, from many, um, um, not only from the Thai company, but also for uh, many other uh, organization um, and company uh, in the region and also outside the region, uh, the Asia and also the, uh, the, the Asia as well. So um, if you are new in joining our, our Zoom meeting since the beginning, you can go um, um, in the Zoom um, when you have your name, you identify yourself, but also you can say hi to us. My name is, and then put it there, I'm coming from um, Vanuatu, I'm, I'm coming from Fiji. Um, if you are not speaking, uh, please mute yourself, mute your microphone so that we cannot hear we can let the, you know, the sound very clear uh, for people who are listening to. Um, and also, you can also turn off your video if you're not speaking in. Um, and also uh, make sure that um, everything you have or th your thought, your comment, uh, any ask uh, you can put in the chat box. Um, um, if you are having some trouble, you can contact us via the chat box as well. Uh, very important uh, at this stage. Um, um, as we move along, um, this meeting, just to let you know, this meeting is recorded um, um, yeah, because it will be used as information uh, outcome of the meeting as well. Uh, the next slide. So um, for today, um, as you, you have seen during the past three days, uh, there's a small box, a box in, a, in a Zoom. Uh, as a globe, right? As a globe, when you have more interpretation, you have all the languages, you can go and choose the Thai languages or English languages, or if you want to hear the background, you can have all the, those options as well, because we want everything to be heard in the language where uh, we are having an event as well. The next slide. So uh, as I, I say today, uh, the agenda is more about um, hearing uh, innovation uh, and also new technology from other countries. Uh, on that, we are going to hear few um, um, few options um, uh, from technology in China, uh, Philippines, and Mongolia. And we'll be having as well some a very quick presentation on how uh, UNICEF we are engaging um, uh, young people in a circular economy. And also, um, uh, there will be a, a panel discussion following at that. Uh, that will basically uh, discuss um, how you can expand the sanitation technology uh, to the last mile people who don't have access to anything. And then uh, we'll be having a reflection at the end of the day uh, on the whole three days of the events. Um, with that, I would like again to thank you very much for joining us and um, stay tuned because during the last session, we have a lot of um, uh, you know, uh, a big expert uh, that will be, you know, reaching out to us, talking to us about uh, the whole progress in sanitation domain and what the sanitation will be looking at uh, for the next generation as well. So uh, stay tuned, don't run away, be in the in a meeting, and we'll learn a lot uh, for for the last uh, for the last two uh, panel discussion as well. So with that, um, I would like to give the floor to one of our partners, 
on, on sharing innovation and technology for other country. And then um, I give the floor to um, Mr. Tana, Tanawat. Over to you, Atawut, sorry. I want to give the floor to Atanawut, sorry. Hi, hi, hi. Thank, Thank you, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, welcome to the uh, the first session today, and welcome back to the um, Thailand Sanitation Expo. My name is Atavut Kumkrong from SEG Thailand. Uh, today, I will be your um, uh, moderator for the panelists today. So, today we have uh, four uh, people, for panelists, and to give us the sharings, the innovations, and technologies from the regions. I mean, we will learn from all of them about the, what are the innovation and technologies that we are uh, used for improving our sanitation. So um, the, first, the first one would be like uh, Mr. Gong from China and Ursula from uh, Philippines and Rafferi from South Africa and, and Benassans from the uh, Mongolia. So uh, welcome uh, you all to join us in the panelists. So. Um, Today, the panelists will uh, starting with the, uh, because uh, yesterday uh, or last two days, we are talking about more in about the Thailand uh, perspective on the products and the uh, any like uh, products and service and industry in the context of the Thailand. So today we are we're learning more on in different countries, different continents and how they works. So that's why uh, we have four of our panelists to join us. Okay, um, today we will start with the first one. It's the uh, Mr. Stephen Gong from uh, uh, General Managers of the uh, Qingdao Alijie Intelligent Technology. So he will be like um, 20 years experience on industries and he's the Associate Managers in general in the Qingdao Alijie Intelligence Technology since 2013. So in charter overall operations, and he got a lot of experience over 20 years. He works in Qingdao, and he mentioned that the Qingdao is a very beautiful coastal uh, city in China. I think I'm agree with him, so because I used to be there, so this is nice. And we hope that we can uh, visit the Qingdao again. So today uh, uh, we will present uh, the, the slides from uh, Mr. Gong uh, about the uh, the negative pressure toilet system, I think, is very interesting problem. Uh, interesting products that uh, we have. We want to learn from him. So, Kim, can you start with the uh, Mr. Gong, please? Dear organizers, guests, and uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mr. Gong Haiyong from Qingdao Alijie Intelligent Technology. Company Limited. Today, I would like to give an introduction to our company and uh, products. Qingdao Alijie Intelligent Technology Company Limited was established in July 2015 in Qingdao, China, with a registered capital of 20 million yuan. It is a state level high technology enterprise focusing on providing raw toilet solutions, product research and development, production and sales. The company maintains close cooperation with the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, Planning and Design. Research Institute. At present, the new raw toilet series products developed micro water intelligent control toilet and self priming for, for fertilizer bucket effectively solve the problem of raw toilets and have been widely promoted and applied in many provinces in China. The products have outstanding performance in many aspects, such as deodorization, cool weather resistance, water saving, and 
organic fertilizer extraction. The products consist of two parts, toilet and fertilizer bucket. The working principle is the waste is pumped from the toilet to the fertilizer bucket through negative pressure suction. Then the waste is harmlessly recycled to the field after fermentation in the fertilizer bucket. Advantages of ne negative pressure self priming toilet system. One, in independent research and development of intellectual property rights. Two, it uses only one tenth of the water of an ordinary toilet. Three, Technical innovation, water blocking, smelly technology, indoor completely no smell. Four, negative pressure suction, prevent facial transmission, reduce the spread of disease, global anti epidemic. Five, deliver to Qingdao port. Only need one hour to install. No clean, no clean instruction. No clean, no clean instruction. It is ready to use right away. Six, after fermenting feces, it is harmless to return to the field and the people themselves can solve the problem. Seven, portable design can be indoor or outdoor anytime and anywhere. Eight, different from other single toilet products, it is not subject to factors such as tearing environment and can be used in both arid and cold. The first picture shows toilet and fertilizer bucket, both indoor. The second picture shows toilet indoor, fertilizer bucket outdoor. More than 80,000 users now use the product in China, covering Heilongjiang province, Jilin, Liaoning, Inner Mongolia, Sanxi, and other provinces regions. So far, no problems and inconvenience. It also can be used in winter even it means 30 degrees. It uh, overcomes the problems of dry toilet reforming. It has been recognized by experts inside and outside the industry and highly prized by local governments and the rural residents. The product has not been exported to foreign markets at present. These are real cases from the field. This is the example before and after the sanitation improvement and uh, feedback from the users. The product is water saving, convenient, and uh, cold resistance, odor free. Thank you very much.
Dear August. So great. So uh, I think we learned from the system that's uh, very interesting, right? Uh, that's it. I think it's good for if there any people would like to ask a question or we can leave the question afterwards. So uh, from now, I think I uh, have no question from the floor. So maybe we start with the, the next people, uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Osular from uh, business managers from the Luba to present their products and service that they have for in case of Philippines perspective. Uh, give it to you for Osular. Thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very nice to meet you and thank you very much for including me um, in this presentation. Um, just to check, will you be sharing my slides on your side? There we go, perfect. Great, so just to um, start very high level, uh, we are a British company and we have introduced a container-based sanitation solution, which we're currently using in the Philippines and also in other countries like in Madagascar. So the whole sort of purpose of our company is that we really invest time in trying to design a toilet experience that's as close to a normal flush toilet so that it's an optimal toilet experience that people can actually be comfortable with and enjoy. So the toilet that we use in the UK, which is very much used for events such as the Royal Wedding, Royal Windsor Horse Show, um, and different high level events, we use exactly the same toilet technology uh, for uh, the Philippines and for Madagascar. It's just the outer casing is different. Okay, so just to take a step back and to explain how the whole system works rather than just the toilet itself, the toilet is obviously the most important element because that's what the, the people use. However, for our system to actually work, it's important to look at the whole value chain of the toilet. So on this slide, you can see um, our value chain. And starting at the top, you can see um, we start with the toilet where we provide our container-based sanitation solution. In the Philippines and in other countries, it's very much focused at the urban poor, so informal settlements where, you know, perhaps they're um, on hard ground or close to waterways and septic tank and other traditional sanitation solutions are not necessarily an option. Uh, that's where our option is, is a good above ground, uh, above ground waterless sanitation solution. So we start with the toilet and this toilet can take any human waste um, and liquids. So it's not urine diverting or anything like that. So you can put all waste in this toilet. And um, how the toilet works is that there's a unique polymer film flush that captures the waste in the polymer film. And this is then um, captured within a container. And this container, as you can see in step four, is then taken for transportation to a safe processing site where the waste is processed. So I think the key message here really is that it's very important to note that as much as we provide a toilet to households, there's a very important service model linked to the toilet. So it's not as simple as just providing the toilets. Uh, we have to work together with a service partner and a waste treatment facility for the whole value chain to work. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. so. Just to give you an idea of when we uh, use the Luwot toilet, because we're not saying that now all households should uh, use a Luwot toilet and that we should uh, replace traditional sewer toilets, but there are certain environments where it's very difficult to use other sanitation forms, and that's where the Luwot toilet is a good fit. So, for example, in the Philippines, uh, where we're working in the city of Manila, it's a very densely populated area, so it was very difficult to retrofit septic tanks, and they're also right by the river, so it's very difficult to actually put a septic tank into the ground because it would leak into the waterways. Um, our toilet is very simple and agile to service, so there's no desludging trucks needed because you have a very small container. And it's also very safe and hygienic in line with the WHO sanitation standards. So it's really designed to be a good toilet experience that's safe and hygienic and odorless. It's an off-grid sanitation solution, so it has very limited infrastructure to install. And it's very suitable in flood-prone areas and mountainous areas. 
And uh, the great thing about the system as well is that there is an opportunity for local job creation in terms of the local waste collection, as you can see in the um, middle picture here. Okay, next slide, please. Great, so here's an overview of what our toilet looks like. So on the left, you can see uh, the fully assembled toilet. So it's fairly easy to, to move into a household and there's no real installation required. Um, as I mentioned before, the toilet can be used with a, a poor flush mechanism. So you can pour water into the toilet. However, the toilet is completely waterless in the way it functions. So you don't need to connect it to any sewer system or to any water. So it's a standalone toilet, but it does take liquid and solid waste as well as poor flush. Um, so on the right, you can see um, the different elements of the toilet and you can see this picture in the middle, that's um, our polymer film. And this polymer film essentially replaces the need for, for a, a water flush and it captures the waste, which is then moved through the toilet and contained below the toilet. So the, the reason why we use this polymer film is to actually create a hygiene barrier um, to prevent smell and to prevent any sort of um, contact with the feces. The feces is then still moved into another container below, which can then be um, moved for transportation. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so here you can have an idea of what it looks like. At no point is this container visible to, to the user. Um, so the container is within the base of the toilet, but you do not see the container at any point. And here the waste is contained. So in the Philippines, for example, uh, the way the model works is that the households, um, once the container is full, they put on the red lid, which is a completely airtight lid and prevents any spillage. And they leave the container outside their home and then the municipality picks up the container just like they uh, collect trash or rubbish um, and they do this twice per week and it just becomes a standard habit for the household. Depending on the country we work in, the model is different. So um, in Madagascar, for example, where we're working as well, um, it's a very different model and it's a paid service, whereas in the Philippines, the city of Manila is currently providing the service just as part of their standard service. Um, next slide, please. So here's just an overview of um, our success so far in the Philippines. So we started in the Philippines in 2017, uh, working with Laguna Water Utility, where we did a pilot study to pilot our technology against another technology um, to really get the in-field feedback and household feedback on, on our design and um, the compatibility with, with the local sort of sanitation needs. And uh, we got very positive feedback, which is actually what enabled this project, um, which we call Cobeta Co in Manila. And here we're working together with the Department of Environment and the Gates Foundation, as well as the City of Manila Municipality and Manilad Utility to roll out this project. So it's a multi-stakeholder project with many different actors as part of the project. But ultimately, the objective is to provide household sanitation to informal settlements that are by the rivers and waterways to prevent open defecation into the rivers. So we're all working together um, for this objective and um, are in the process of rolling out more Luwot toilets um, to the households. And then another project that we're working on um, this year is also with the city of Manila. They are very much um, focused on um, emergency situations because there's lots of uh, fires and floods in, in the Philippines. And they're also going to trial our toilet in an emergency situation to see if that's an alternative solution that they could use um, our system for. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here on the right, you can see some photos of our toilet in Manila. So you can see the households uh, that are being targeted by the city of Manila municipality are very, very small informal settlements. And the reason these households were selected is because they didn't have any access to toilets before. They didn't have any septic tanks um, and they didn't have any sort of way of, of actually using a toilet. So they were practicing open defecation and it was going directly into the river, causing a very high pollution of the river. And that is exactly what this project is supposed to avoid. So working together with the local community and the municipality, um, these toilets have been um, provided for the households. 
And um, the idea of this project actually was to also create local jobs. So within the local community, which they call the barangay in the Philippines, we actually have selected local barangay staff to do the whole collection from the household and they work with the municipality to, to transport the waste containers back to Manilad, the waste utility. So it's really um, a great sort of community project where everyone's working together to make the whole system work. And as much as we provide a toilet, um, it's really important that the whole system works and that the containers are collected regularly. Otherwise, the, the system doesn't work. So um, it's not as simple as providing a toilet and sort of walking away. It's really important to actually um, invest time to actually set up the service model together um, in the community. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so here are just some more photos to give you an idea of, of what the um, system looks like once it's um, in the households. So um, as you can see, uh, the toilet here, it's on the base. Uh, the container is below the base. You see another container in this picture because it's a spare container that's been provided to the household in case of an emergency or a miscollection. But generally speaking, um, the, there's actually been no issues even during COVID with the service collection. Um, and yeah, as you can see, there's lots of different people using the toilet in the Philippines at the stage. And um, yeah, we're actually um, looking to roll out another project in another LGU in the Philippines uh, this year. So that's quite exciting. And then just next slide. Yeah, so here's just another photo to show you that uh, sometimes the houses are a little bit too small and it's very difficult to fit the toilet because the houses are, are so full already. Um, so there's also the option that the, the toilets can be placed in an outer structure. So um, actually the picture on the left in the middle um, was in South Africa where they um, had different structures and the picture on the right is in the Philippines where they just made a very basic structure next to the home. So um, I guess the key message is that the toilet's quite versatile and it can be placed in all sorts of different structures. And I think just um, as a very sort of um, concluding message, um, our success in the Philippines is really down to our, our partners and working together with the local municipality and Manilad to set up this project. And um, ultimately, um, for, this, for our sanitation project to succeed, it's really important that we work together with local partners and the community because initially it is very difficult to set up new projects. Uh, it's new technology. Um, households might be resistant to use toilets when they haven't really been familiar with using toilets, especially this type of toilets. And um, together with our local partners, we really um, managed to do a lot of information and education campaigns and really got excitement around the toilet and got the people interested. And, and that's really um, how we've been successful. Um, so, yeah, if you have any more questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me or, or write some questions in the chat. My email address is here on the slide and here's also our website, um, but happy to discuss any more questions if you have any. Thank you so much and all the best. So thank you, Osla. I think it's interesting from the audience. We have many uh, questions. So I think the to follow up questions with you. So uh, maybe the same as the Mr. Kong from the previous presentation as well. So um, uh, somebody would like to understand about um, how to distribute your product to the the low income user, something like that. So is it is it they have to buy by themselves or somebody know that to know that uh, donate to him? What is your business model? So um, every project we've done, the model has been different. And I think the answer is that every community or every city is different. So a different model needs to be adapted to the local environment. So in, in Manila, so we have two projects in the Philippines. And in the one project, um, currently the city of Manila is providing the toilet to the households. And the cost is covered through an environmental tariff that they're paying on their water bill. So there's a 20% uh, environmental tariff, which is essentially a sanitation tariff, and that is, um, that is subsidizing the system. Um, in other parts of the Philippines, the environmental tariff is not as high, so it might not fully cover um, the system or they might not want to use a cross subsidy. And what they do there is that they want to introduce a household uh, service fee. And this service fee will be introduced as part of the collection mechanism. So as you, as you collect the full waste container and replace an empty one, 
uh, there will be a, a fee paid. And this is also something that we're trialing at the moment in South Africa, where they're looking at different sort of um, payment models that could work. And um, in Madagascar, we do it fully on mobile money and the service is paid for on, on mobile money. So um, ideally, it works best if we work with the local municipality and utility so that there is an option of uh, using tariff structures. But uh, if that's not a possibility, then there can just be a fee for service uh, model that can be introduced. But this, this really needs to be adapted depending on local regulation and uh, local subsidy and tariff structures. So a lot of questions, of people would seem like the audience would like to buy more. So they ask you more about the, the private unit. And together with one another question that's uh, popular is now is uh, how to treat the, the fec fecal uh, sludge from your container. So can you elaborate a little bit more on the cost on unit and how to manage the sludge after that? Yeah, so, th so the, the cost is actually a very difficult one because it's not as simple as selling a unit and then because you have the service element linked to it. So normally, Ideally, what we would do is work with a local partner that provides the service and the unit, and then the cost structure might differ. So I know this is a very bad answer because it doesn't answer the question. Mm -hmm. And I think um, this is something that maybe if, if people want to reach out to me, we can look at the local sort of dynamics to be able to give a better answer. And I can share um, more detail on how it is exactly in the Philippines and in Madagascar. But um, Basically, the, the challenge around the system is that it's really a system and not a toilet. So it's important that you have many toilets in one area for it to work well and for the cost to come down. Um, as there is a, a, a collection mechanism that needs to be introduced, if you just have one toilet in one rural area, it's, a, it's very difficult to set up a collection for one toilet. So um, in Manila, the reason we were successful is because we chose one small community and they've put in hundreds of toilets in the small community, so it's easy to set up a collection and it's much more cost effective um, rather than if you really disperse like five toilets across one country, it's very difficult. Um, in terms of the, the waste treatment, the sludge treatments, um, so the local municipality uh, works with Manilad in this area, which is a, a utility in Manila. And they work together with Luwot and we've uh, provided what's called the Luwot processing machine and it's a very simple machine that you just tip in the full waste container. And this machine is designed to separate uh, the polymer film that contains the waste uh, from the human waste. And then the human waste was fed directly back into uh, the waste treatment facility that Manilad has. So this is one option that can work if you have an existing waste treatment facility. But if you do not have a waste treatment facility like what we had in Madagascar, we set up um, an anaerobic digestion system and a pasteurizer, and that was actually fairly low cost overall to set that up. And uh, the reason why we set that up there is because we were really interested in the circular economy and to create um, biogas from the waste and also to create fertilizer as a byproduct. And then we sell the fertilizer sort of back to be able to subsidize the whole system. So. This is what I mean with it's quite a flexible system. So depending on your environment and your needs, there is an option to do the energy from waste component. And there's also an option just to plug into existing infrastructure. So um, it's really on a case by case basis that the cost needs to be discussed because depending on the value chain that you select for your area, the cost will differ, if that makes sense. I think that's okay. So we will elaborate a little bit more on the, uh, the last session. So uh, we have to move to the next speaker. So um, from um, from now on, we, we are learning about like uh, uh, self-containing the toilet system. So now we will learn from the problem and situations on sanitation in South Africa. So I got my friends from, uh, Lefery from the uh, Prana Consultants, and she is like the experts on the civil engineer for many years, and she works on like the uh, development and commercialization of off-grid and water sanitation solution in South Africa. So uh, Lefery, uh, it's time for you. Can you share your experience about your situations in South Africa now? Thank you so much, Atawood, and thanks uh, for the invitation to come and be part of this prestigious 
panel. Um, I've learned quite a lot uh, from Ursula with regards to the LUAD solution, and um, clearly a lot of work has been put in into the solution and you're testing different uh, markets and looking at the different models. I think that's that's quite powerful. And also from Stephen as well, quite a very interesting and intriguing uh, presentation on the negative pressure uh, sewer suction uh, uh, solutions. So my name is Rufi Leli Sufi and I am the founding uh, director of Prana Consulting. Prana Water and Sanitation is the subsidiary of uh, Prana Consulting. What Prana Consulting does is that we offer uh, solutions to government, all three spheres of government, from national to provincial and municipal government, um, where we focus on municipal infrastructure, such as water and sewer. So when the opportunity came for us to learn a bit more about unconventional ways of dealing with uh, sanitation, it fell right into what we had been doing, answering the questions that we had struggled with um, as a company, because as you will learn from my presentation, South Africa is a, not too unique, but it's got very unique problems when it comes to infrastructure. Next slide, please. And I put that um, SDG uh, picture uh, in the introductory slide to remind us of why we are actually doing this. We are trying to meet the um, sustainable development goal number six. Um, I'm going to talk very quickly about the pain points and challenges that face South African uh, sanitation. And we're going to talk about a product that we are looking at together with Atterwood and the SDG uh, Thailand team. We're going to talk about the product use and what market segments uh, we've been targeting it for. Next slide, please. So just to give a bit of a background as to South Africa and its status quo with regards to sanitation, we've got aging and failing uh, infrastructure. Um, this has happened for many reasons because South Africa is one of the most unequal country. Um, we've got urban settlements, we've got semi-urban, and we've got rural. Um, we've got uh, a infrastructure gap uh, in between those three different sectors. And it is as a result of the apartheid system uh, legacy, which uh, we've just come out of in, in 1994, where money was concentrated on improving infrastructure in certain areas to certain demographical groups. And after uh, 1994, then we've seen quite a lot of movement within uh, the country, uh, which has resulted in the infrastructure currently that had been put in uh, struggling to cope with capacity. We have quite a lot of people moving from rural areas coming to cities in search of uh, jobs, which is another big problem that we have in South Africa, which is unemployment. So now we end up with having quite high densities um, and, and concentration of human settlements in areas and the capacity of the infrastructure that has been put there becomes inadequate. Just to paint a bit of a picture, uh, mostly in rural areas, we tend to have dry sanitation um, where people rely on on-site uh, sanit uh, sanitation such as pit latrines. However, these pit latrines are normally not designed properly. The material and the designs uh, do not quite meet the minimum specification, which has resulted in quite catastrophic um, incidents where children have fallen into pit latrines and, and have actually died. Now, if you look at the cities where we've got the golden standard, as they, as they call it, um, where we've got flushing toilets, which then collect to bulk services that take the waste to wastewater treatment plants, and then it gets treated, and then it gets put back into the water cycle. The issues there are quite vast. As I've said, uh, the infrastructure was installed quite a long time ago, and not for the number of people um, that it was designed, uh, that, that it's currently catering for. We've got poor maintenance, and as a result, um, we end up with poorly treated sewer, uh, which is then being put back into our freshwater um, resources, such as rivers. So it's become a really big problem in South Africa, and it became very important for us to try and look for alternative ways of dealing with the, the problems. Now, in our country, it, government is mandated to actually provide uh, the basic services, water and sanitation being part of it. 
So the biggest buyer of sanitation uh, solutions and services will be uh, government through all different uh, the three spheres of government. And I need to mention quickly that we've also got a lot of backlog uh, due to budget issues, um, due to incompetency in, 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 in an incapable um, municipalities and provinces, we've got big problems with our backlogs. So we end up with a lot of people living without the basic sanitation that's required. Next slide, please. So um, in most areas, as I've said, we have absolutely no sewer and no water. People have to rely on um, pit latrines for sewer. And then where they do have the affordability, then they have to drill water out uh, of the ground in order for them to be able to get some form of uh, water to use for drinking and for hygiene and day-to-day -day use. A significant pro uh, proportion of our population, 86%, relies on on-site sanitation uh, alternatives that includes uh, septic tanks as well as pit latrines. And 22, only 22% is has improved uh, sanitation, and 14% is unimproved. So there's a big scope uh, for the new in innovative uh, sanitation ideas that are coming through for the country. We've got over 4,000 uh, public schools under the DBE, which have inappropriate sanitation. Um, the recent uh, incident of a child drowning in a school um, in a pit latrine has led to a presidential initiative where government has actually put money uh, towards the replacement of the pit latrines in order to provide safe and dignified uh, sanitation solutions for our learners. We've got 2.8 million households which use unimproved uh, sanitation facilities, uh, 280,000 households which still practice open defecation. And the two segments that we're looking at is the public sector, uh, in schools, clinics, and hospitals, uh, especially in rural and peri-urban uh, areas. And then we're also looking at uh, remote businesses uh, where they use septic tanks and they end up with a high cost uh, of collecting the, the sewage sewer and treat. Next slide, please. Please move to the next slide. Thank you so much. So we've partnered with SDG. I won't get into the details. I'm sure that a lot has been shared uh, with regards to the, the solutions that they have. But what we are doing is that we are testing the aquatic tank in South Africa, uh, both the 600 liters and the 1000 liters. We have retrofitted them onto existing septic tanks and urinals, um, both in, a, in an industrial setting and also a residential setting. Um, we're currently doing uh, the testing in Johannesburg. Um, we're testing uh, for on-ground installation as well as underground installation so that we can see both uh, installation methods, what is more practical, what is quicker, what is cheaper. And we're testing for user acceptance. We're testing for robustness and efficiency under the local conditions. Um, South Africa has uh, fluctuating temperatures throughout the different seasons, and um, we're going to, it's going to be very interesting to see this technology that comes from a, a, a warm country, such as Thailand, how it's going to do in South Africa. And then thereafter, we're going to be looking at piloting it um, on a larger scale and then commercializing to both public and private sector markets. Next slide, please. So um, we have uh, currently got uh, other companies which are looking at different technologies within South Africa, uh, most of them being uh, dry sanitations. Um, I won't get into this because I'm, I'm really running out of time, but they've all got their challenges and uh, their pros as well. And we are hoping that the system that we are testing with SCG will address the issues that these uh, companies are struggling with to, to find a solution that is, uh, befitting of South African conditions. Next slide, please.
So the challenges that we have is uh, it takes very long um, in South Africa for policy to change. Um, currently, uh, D, uh, DWETs, uh, decentralized systems, uh, do not form part of our sanitation policy, but we've got standards that have actually been upgraded to speak towards the use of uh, DWETs in the country. And we're looking forward to policy actually changing to be in line uh, with, with the new uh, systems. And then culture, uh, we've got a, a very bad culture of no or low pay for services in general, sanitation being the worst of it. So considering the capital amount that needs to be put towards these units, um, people are generally not willing to pay for sanitation and water. They would rather pay for data or for electricity. So that's going to take quite a, a big paradigm shift to get people to want to pay for these services. But then again, maybe it will be um, assisted by government who's supposed to be providing the basic services. Um, they could cover uh, most of that cost and then try and recover through tariffs um, from the users. User behavior is going to be another challenge. We currently testing right at the beginning of the testing. So I can't really give more data um, on, on, on our findings. Uh, but a lot of people who've always used pit latrines, it's going to become very difficult for them to change their behavior. Um, research shows that uh, they tend to use the pit latrines for uh, waste, uh, solid waste, like they throw things inside the toilet. So this is going to become a challenge for the system um, to, and it's going to get blocked. So it's going to take a lot of uh, education and, and information. Um, I see that my time is up, um, so I'll just say thank you so much. You can skip to the next slide. We've got the details there for Prana Consulting. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to present. So thank you, Rafael. So we're running out of time, so maybe we follow up later. So can we go next to the next speaker is the uh, Benansons from the UNICEF Mongolia. So we share our experience about the uh, uh, the case in the minus 40, how we can use the toilet to the challenge there. So, uh, uh, Benazan, can you uh, revelate more on this? Yeah, thank you very much. So I will uh, make it short uh, and uh, more concise. So can you show the next slide, please? So as I said, uh, Mongolia has a unique challenge, uh, quite cold in, uh, uh, several months in winter, which in the minus 40, which, is, which makes it difficult, uh, especially for uh, small children go out. So then uh, because of these challenges, we, uh, uh, UNICEF is supporting uh, uh, local governments to, to improve the situation uh, using the shipping containers. So uh, that's the, the solution we, which we tested uh, and replicated during the last almost 10 years. Can you show the next slide? So um, inside the container, it looks uh, like this uh, photo, which have um, uh, all required uh, uh, equipment starting from heating, water boiler, um, sinks, um, flash toilets, uh, and so, so on. So then uh, the, the, we usually, normally we, we use it uh, um, 20 feet container, shipping container, and uh, we have certain standards to, to insulate properly to protect from cold in the winter. So then um, uh, uh, depending on the Location, uh, this um, uh, unit usually attached to existing building uh, in the settlement areas, in most cases, uh, already existed service system. Then uh, the cost of connection and operation and maintenance is easier. Uh, in, 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 in remote places, uh, then we need to, uh, additionally, we need to uh, construct a septic system or wastewater tank, which uh, should be properly uh, disposed. So then, then in that case, the cost is uh, also needed to uh, be allocated for wastewater treatment. Um, 
Okay, then um, uh, can you show next slide, please? Then uh, this uh, shipping uh, container uh, um, solution is uh, replicated in many uh, wash uh, um, ideas, like uh, for providing uh, uh, water supply, uh, constructing the top house uh, for the groundwater well, for water kiosk, uh, and so on, and so on, yeah. So <clears throat> uh, nowadays uh, we are also um, trying to uh, make um, a mobile clinic uh, using shipping containers for prevention of COVID-19. And also at the same time, we are um, uh, going to construct uh, a shipping container type uh, mobile uh, wash facility, which uh, later can be easily attached to the mobile clinic uh, clinics. Yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a sample photo, uh, the shipping container, which is used for uh, drinking water well and water cask. So we, uh, <clears throat> for using the shipping container, of course, we can add many uh, uh, equipments um, like a solar panel, uh, automatic uh, sensing, uh, water delivery system, um, water uh, filters, for improving water quality, et cetera. Next slide, please. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Over. Hello. Thank you uh, for your presentation. I think it's interesting for the children that in very cold country like Mongolia, how to use the toilet at that uh, very low temperatures, right? So uh, it seemed like you uh, modified the, the uh, container right and to put some the heating device and manage everything inside the toilet right uh what is the the is it is it the high cost to do that yes in terms of cost uh, for the uh, 20 feet container it's roughly costed uh, including all the equipment it's costed uh, around twenty thousand us dollars per one container unit mm -hmm. Uh -huh. If if we are going to install in a remote place, of course, uh, we need to add the, the transportation cost, plus uh, we need to add the wastewater treatment cost or wet, wet, wastewater uh, treatment facility cost. Oh, this one is not including the treatment unit, right? No. Oh, the just only the toilet room. Okay, yeah. so thank you very much for that. So, um. During uh, because of the time is is the uh, running out now, so um, uh, I think we learn a lot from the uh, our partners, uh, panelists around the world on sharing the experience on the our system. Uh, the system is quite interesting. So especially from the uh, negative pressures uh, toilet systems and the uh, Luwat uh, product system, I think it's a, can be applicable to the um, the uh, rural area. So I think if you have like the further questions on these, I think you can send directly to Mr. Kong and Ursula. Then if you're interested on the uh, experience on the uh, Prana Consultings in South Africa and how to adopt the, the technologies and you can uh, ask with them. So, and, and Banasans also gave us the uh, experience on how to develop the uh, product for low temperature country. So uh, I think it's uh, from now on, I think it's uh, the end of uh, my panelists because it's running out of time. So thank you everyone for these sessions and we will look forward to our, the next session. So I return to you, the Iwa or Brooke. Thank you Great. very much. Oh, okay. Good. Brooke, go Brooke, you can go, yeah. Great, thank you so much, um, Adawood, and thanks all the presenters for that really fascinating session. I think there's a, been a lot of questions in chat in the chat box, so maybe just to echo what um, Adawood said, if all the presenters could share their contact information, maybe their website, or where we can find more information about um, what they just presented in the chat box, that would be great, and please do keep all of the chats uh, coming. So my name is Brooke Yamakoshi, and I think 
for those of you that were on yesterday, um, you may already recognize my face. For the rest of you, I am a WASH specialist working with UNICEF's regional office for East Asia and the Pacific based in Bangkok. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm going to just briefly take 10 minutes to share some thoughts and opportunities and initiatives about engaging young people in the sanitation economy, moving from a crisis, perhaps both for the sanitation sector um, and perhaps for youth employment uh, to an opportunity by connecting the two. Um, and I'm, I'm going to make a start with a short presentation for thought for uh, some food for thought and then hand it over to my colleague Evariste for some reflections and then after that we'll move into the next panel. So young people's employment in Asia Pacific, what do we know? Well, first of all, the East Asia and Pacific region is a huge region <laughs> and it's growing and developing and changing rapidly. So there's been millions of people moving out of poverty, particularly in the past two, three decades, driven by strong economic growth. And this has also provided a lot of opportunities and aspirations for a dynamic and diverse demographic of young people across the region. Uh, so nearly 330 million adolescents, as you can see, and more young people loosely defined. I know many of us may like to still consider ourselves young um, over that 330 million. And, and these, this adolescent population uh, accounts for a quarter of the world's total adolescence. So this is a big and powerful force. They have different aspirations perhaps than their parents' generation um, and a different outlook for their future. But young people in the region also face higher levels of unemployment than adults. So some estimates put this in some places at three times more unemployment. And the pandemic has worsened this crisis. So according to the data from this ILO and ADB report that you can see referenced on the screen, the pandemic has challenged prospects for young people in multiple ways. So first of all, young people were more likely than older adults to lose their job during the pandemic. And Many of them are also facing a suspension of education or a temporary disruption to um, training, which may have long-term repercussions for their job prospects and their skills development, which is one of the reasons that as UNICEF, we've been advocating strongly for a safe return to school globally. Um, as a result, you can see in this slide that youth unemployment rates uh, may be rising quickly in the region, particularly for um, maybe for women uh, or for certain demographics. Now, um, one interesting characteristic of the youth labor market in the region is that when paid jobs are difficult to get, and even when they're available, many young workers um, are turning to entrepreneurship. And many, um, young people see self-employment and entrepreneurship as a means of gaining their independence and of earning a higher income with more autonomy. And this also has great implications for other young people because young entrepreneurs are more likely to hire other young people. On the next slide, um, I wanted to briefly touch on some of the trends in the sanitation labor force. So a report from IWA in 2014, titled An Avoidable Crisis, found that there are not enough appropriately skilled uh, water and sanitation professionals to support the attainment of universal access to safe water and sanitation. And this is particularly acute in the sanitation sector. So for example, the study found that in this region, um, the Philippines, for instance, required, they estimated uh, over 80,000 additional technicians, um, while Papua New Guinea would need to multiply its current WASH workforce by a factor of nine to achieve universal coverage. So because of this, we see that sanitation services in the region can be undermined. Um, and that um, there's also sometimes a lack of training and skills development programs to, um, to direct people to good quality jobs or entrepreneurship opportun opportunities in sanitation. Um, I also wanted to point out that women professionals are particularly underrepresented um, in the sanitation sector. And at the bottom of this uh, slide, you can see that the most recent glass report 
showed that only 11% of countries reporting against this indicator um, said that they had sufficient human resources to implement their urban sanitation policies and plans. So that's quite low. On the next slide, um, I wanted to bring this together with this graphic for thought about the sanitation economy from the Toilet Board Coalition that many of you may be uh, familiar with. So really what we're talking about here is an oversupply of young people who are looking for decent work and opportunities for entrepreneurship and independence. And in the meantime, we have a huge need for a professionalized, skilled sanitation workforce full of opportunities for entrepreneurship as well as um, skilled and decent paid work. So how can we link these up? Well, here in this graphic about the sanitation economy, you can see opportunities that go beyond just the traditional sanitation sector jobs, though we also desperately need safer and more of those jobs. But there are opportunities for work in technology development and innovation, which we've discussed quite a bit this week, in things like data science, as well as just ongoing service provision. So there, there are many jobs beyond the usual and there's great opportunities out there. So how can we start to link these up? Well, we can do this perhaps by uh, making sure that we have good capacity assessments um, in, the, in the sector, as well as um, strong market assessments that show the potential and where people could be getting engaged and taking advantage of the sanitation economy. But we also need to marry this with outreach to young people and skills, skills that are both technical and in entrepreneurship and innovation. And I think that the COVID-19 pandemic recovery will offer a great opportunity to invest in upskilling um, and reskilling young people to be able to meet the need for wash services, which we're seeing like none other. So my last slide before I turn it over to my colleague Everest for his thoughts is an example of an initiative where we're trying to marry together this need in the sector um, with opportunities for dynamic young people to put their entrepreneurship and innovation skills um, to work and to scale their, uh, their work to be able to reach more people. So we've initiated a Young Wash Changemakers program to be able to support young social innovators and entrepreneurs working in WASH. And you can see here an example, this was our first cohort of Changemakers last year um, who completed the program, they were the first ones. And their work spanned from turning uh, CO2 into hand sanitizer um, to, you know, things like more effective behavior change at the community level. Thanks, Kim, for working with the slide here. Um, and this year, we've launched the second edition, um, uh, which, uh, Kim, would you prefer? Okay, great. You can see, I, we can see the notes, I think, in that, in that version, Kim. So maybe you can try to reshare. Yeah, that's perfect like that. Thank you. Um, so, so this year we've launched the second edition, um, and this, this is with young people working in with mostly uh, in sanitation and hygiene. And one note that I wanted to say about our forthcoming second cohort is that it's uh, nearly all women, um, which is really interesting and I hope will be um, showing a wider dynamic of a more gender balanced and diverse sanitation sector. So again, our goal here is to help young people gain skills and to be able to develop and scale their WASH innovations. Um, and also to use these young WASH change makers to mobilize their youth networks um, and to find opportunities for partnerships, um, such as the partnerships that we've been discussing here today with other businesses, um, with, uh, with academia, exploring opportunities to have young people active in commercialization and development of new technologies. So with that, I'll conclude and turn it over to Avariste before we go into the next panel. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Brooke. Um, I just want to put two, two points um, 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 just uh, to support your presentation. The first one is 10% of the global job um, are related to water sanitation. This is one of the the report that was released in 2015, but this report has not been updated. And it's something that we need to think, you know, to have in mind when we are talking about the reskilling, you know, putting your people at the center of delivering water and sanitation services. I think it's very important. 
Uh, the second point is that, you know, working along the service chain, the whole chain of the sanitation services is very important. If you want to activate each of the part of the chain, make, making the service sustainable. And I'm very happy to see what to do, what is doing as well, and bringing not only the product to the household, but also building the whole chain behind that. I think this is fundamental if you want to basically ensure sustainability of the services and also make sure that we create a new job around the sanitation chain as well, which is uh, fundamental. I want to put two other points um, um, forward that you know create a food for thought for many other you know um, participants and also company. One is the work that has been done by Asia Institute of Technology, put in some of the toolbox to make sure that young people and also new entrepreneurs can learn more about the whole chain and that's why they can activate um, their skill and knowledge and to be more entrepreneur. And then the second point, very fundamental is, we need also to think about the whole green economy, right? Putting everything back to the nature. It's why this need innovation, a lot of innovation. And I do think like Brooke share with us all, uh, innovation of young people is very fundamental if you want to take the whole sanitation to the next level. So I'll stop here and give back to floor to, uh, to Brooke for the next panel. Over to you, Brooke. Great, thanks, Eva. So our next panel, and you can see that Kim has already put up the slide, which is great. So we're gonna be talking about inequalities and expanding sanitation to what we call the last mile or the last unserved people, people that are hardest to reach or maybe left behind because of specific vulnerabilities or marginalizations. So on to the next slide. Thank you, Kim. So as we heard from my colleague Kelly yesterday, um, the overall story of sanitation in the East Asia and Pacific region that you can see on this graph is one of rapid progress, and it's a it's really been a, a very optimistic story. And this represents the improvement of living conditions and health and dignity for millions of people, um, hundreds of millions of people across the region. So remembering the data that Kelly shared on Wednesday about the use of safely managed sanitation doubling between 2000 and 2017, as you can see on the graph, with 800 million uh, new users since the year 2000, with open defecation um, decreasing, this um, deprivation that really disproportionately affects people in rural areas and the poorest people. So um, this is great news. But we know that everyone, and the language of the SDG, um, everyone means everyone. And this is also recognized in the human right um, to water and sanitation, which was recognized by the UN General Assembly in 2010. Um, and again, sanitation being affirmed as a separate right in 2015. So the, the human right to sanitation not only means that everybody needs to have access to a toilet, but also um, that we uh, should all be able to live in an environment um, that's free of feces and of unmanaged uh, wastewater, um, untreated wastewater or fecal waste. So despite strong progress in the region, there are inequalities that remain. And some of these inequalities are um, at a regional level and some may be um, at a national level or a subnational level. Um, so there are personal, also personal factors, even within a household, that may be less visible in these sorts of charts, which do household level monitoring, but similarly can have a big impact on people's quality of life. So these inequalities might be because of gender, because of age, maybe because of certain status in society, um, or maybe uh, disability status. So there's also um, this, these inequalities have, have very big uh, implications for all of us. So working in this sector of how to meet the demand with um, cost-effective and affordable solutions that also are meeting the needs of people living in these unique maybe environments um, or who are hardest to reach where markets may not be extending to them. So on the next slide, I'd like to show, again, digging a little bit more into the rate of progress in the region and showing that it hasn't been even. 
Accelerating access to uh, sanitation by 2030 um, is a real priority. You can see here that the rate at which new users of basic sanitation are being added um, will be insufficient in many countries and perhaps also for many subgroups or subregions within, uh, within countries that are even on track in aggregate. Data gaps and limited trends mean that we don't have this sort of a triangle chart to be able to show you for safely managed sanitation um, as only six out of 27 countries in the last um, cycle of, of joint monitoring program reporting were able to report on uh, or have estimates for safely managed sanitation services. And also just as a note, not all countries are on track to eliminate open defecation by 2030, despite strong regional progress um, and indeed strong global progress. So I think that inequality is worth um, continuing to point out. So the next slide is my last slide before we move into our um, distinguished panel for today. And this is the really the purpose of why we're here this week is because of regional learning and regional exchange. So we can see from this chart that Thailand has both high levels of basic sanitation um, services and also relatively low levels of inequality by wealth, which is really great to see. Um, and this means that the experiences that we heard this week from colleagues across the private sector in Thailand and soon um, in this panel from the public sector, um, the experiences on both basic and safely managed sanitation services will be really important for other countries. And I wanted to point out again, as Kelly did on Wednesday, that 91% of improved sanitation facilities in Thailand are, are um, septic tanks. And that so therefore there's a lot to learn about uh, management of on-site sanitation for other countries in the region. So we're really pleased then on the next slide um, to introduce this panel. And um, our panel today, we have four panelists who will be discussing um, inequalities and in reaching the last mile. So first we have Kun Su Chai Jane Pochanat, who's the deputy director for technical and planning at the Wastewater Management Authority in the Ministry of Interior in Thailand. So Kun Su Chai has worked in the Wastewater Management Authority for over 20 years, and he holds an MSc in civil and environmental engineering from George Washington University in the US. Next we have uh, Dr. Chaiwi Wong Charonrong, who's the Director of Domestic Wastewater Section in the Pollution Control Department. Uh, Dr. Chaiwi has a PhD in biomechanics from the University of Texas at Austin. And he's also um, does consulting on environmental regulations and he's a columnist in a Japanese environmental journal. Um, next we have Kun Wipa Rujia Janakul, who is working as a public health technical officer at the Bureau of Environmental Health in the Department of Health here in Thailand. And before her current position, she had served as a sanitation technical officer um, and also previously worked with the Public Health Law Administration Center. And our final panelist is Mr. Mike White, who is a senior urban development specialist in, with a focus on water supply and sanitation in the Southeast Asia Department of the Asian Development Bank. And he's been based in Southeast Asia for 25 years, more than 25 years now. Um, and he heads the technical team for the development and implementation of water supply, sanitation, solid waste, and urban development projects by the Asian Development Bank across Southeast Asia. So thanks to all of our fantastic panelists for jo joining us today. So my first question is going to be for Kun Su Chai of the Wastewater Management Authority. And before we get started with that question, I did want to remind everybody that this panel will be in both um, in both English and Thai, and we do have an interpretation function again at the bottom of the screen. So I'll invite you all to choose the uh, language that you would like to listen in, be it English or Thai, for this panel. And I'll ask um, my colleague Kim if he can put up the slides, uh, as I believe Kun Su Chai will be using some slides for this first question. So Kun Su Chai, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, as we heard, evidence from around the world suggests that poor communities 
are more likely to be at the end of the pipe. So in other words, being affected by the unsafe discharge of wastewater into their communities. So can you tell us about the work of the Wastewater Management Authority in expanding, uh, expanding wastewater treatment in Thailand and particularly about new technologies? Thank you. Afternoon, and uh, I, I would like to go to my first slide, please. So uh, Kim, I believe it's the first slide, the same slide deck that we originally uh, were using, but I can project it from my side if you prefer. Maybe you can just unmute and let me know what you... Great, great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Wastewater Management Authority is a state enterprise under the Ministry of Interior. And I would like to, to share with you with the topic of domestic wastewater management in Thailand, especially under the WMA or Wastewater Management Authority. Next slide, please. Our vision is to manage municipal wastewater to meet the standard with sustainability within the year 2026. And we are three main mission. One is uh, the construction of central wastewater treatment plant. And the second one is to provide services of wastewater uh, operation and maintenance. And the third one is to provide services or other activities related to effective wastewater treatment with the future economic benefits. Next slide, please. And these are the summarize of the situation of wastewater management in Thailand. And I believe that uh, the representative from Pollution Control Department will uh, define in details later on. So the total of domestic wastewater in Thailand is about 9.6 uh, million cubic meter per day. And uh, we have around 105 treatment plants or a little bit more than that. And with the capacity of 3.22 million cubic meter per day of approximately 33% of uh, the total wastewater treatment plant. And of those 105 treatment plants is about 62 uh, treatment plants uh, are under the wastewater management authority at the moment. Next slide, please. And this is uh, our main uh, activities. Uh, the first one is to construct, to construct and manage water quality or management center projects. And at the moment, under WMA responsibilities, 26 wastewater treatment plants are constructed and operated and all of them are underground system. And the second one is to improve and rehabilitation uh, central wastewater uh, treatment plants of local authority. Currently, we hold 29 from uh, 105 central treatment plants. And the third one is to manage wastewater treatment plant projects according to guidelines for the project under Royal Initiatives. And the WMA has contacted seven wastewater treatment plants under the project of Royal uh, Initiatives. And the fourth one is to, uh, for water reuse. Uh, WMA has reused treated wastewater at all 62 treatment plants. And currently we have signed with private sector to sell our treat, treated wastewater as the raw water for a water supply in uh, eastern part of Thailand. Next, please. We look forward for a 20 years wastewater management plan. And uh, this, this plan is awaiting cabinet approval at the moment. So I can summarize uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the conceptual of the 
uh, management plan. So the target area is 462, uh, 64, I'm sorry, local authorities with 780 uh, central wastewater treatment plants will be constructed. And uh, we hope that 106 million cubic meter per day of uh, wastewater will be treated. And we can serve at, at least about 10 million uh, population with the uh, water reuse is about 200 million cubic meter per year. So next slide. These are our management system. So we set up the wastewater monitoring center of Thailand. And uh, under this center, we can uh, manage the all 62 uh, treatment plants with online monitoring system. We use SCADA also to uh, operate the system in case of emergency or uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic that we cannot enter the area. And we can use this uh, center as a teleconference, which help us save a lot of money for traveling. And we have CCTV also. And the most important is we can monitor the greenhouse gas emission um, that we can use online system as well. Next slide, please. So this could be the summarize of my presentation uh, for the first session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kun Su Chai. Um, that's a great overview of the Wastewater Management Authority, um, your activities, what you all that you're managing, as well as how reuse, reuse of treated wastewater has been benefiting uh, farmers in dry areas. Um, and great also to see the monitoring center that we can see you're sitting in today and to learn a little bit more about how you're tracking things online and particularly how you've ensured services during the, uh, the pandemic. Um, now we're going to turn to Dr. Chai Wee from the Thailand Pollution Control Department. And I understand that, um, so we're going to move a little bit from thinking about uh, you know, wastewater treatment uh, to looking at that, zooming in on the household level. And I understand that the Thailand Pollution Control Department has been developing a green sticker certification program for septic tanks. So could you just briefly tell us about how uh, the, well, how this program works and also what, what problem it was intended to solve. So over to you, Dr. Chaiwi. Hello. Yes, we hear uh, you back here. Uh, can you see my picture? You can? Yes. Uh, you can, okay. So as you may know that, um, uh, please uh, show my slide. Uh, there's only one slide from Pollution Control Department. Uh, can you can you see? So my Kim, slide? I believe it was the last slide. If you could go back yeah, one yeah. slide uh, to the the next next one from this one in the main slide deck. Uh, um, here, let me share from my side. Yeah, this one, yeah. <coughs> okay, uh, from, okay, as you may know that like uh, domestic wastewater uh, is now considered as the worst uh, wastewater problem uh, for Thailand. Uh, because This is just because of the a rapid growth of the number of the people uh, living in the city or coming to live in the city uh, in the past 20 years. Uh, however, uh, the government is not uh, quick enough uh, to uh, build uh, the sanitation system for them. So currently, according to this figure, we have approximately 9.9 .9, uh, million cubic meter per day of wastewater generated from our population of roughly 66 million people. How, however, we have a central wastewater treatment plant which has capacity to treat, um, this is uh, according to the WMA uh, presentation, uh, about roughly 3 million cubic meter per day. Uh, that is actually on a good day. 
uh, which means that um, on a good day, uh, about 30% uh, uh, or less uh, of wastewater from household is actually properly treated. So this is why we are required, uh, still required homeowner to, uh, even though they are li uh, living in the service area of the central wastewater treatment plant, uh, to install a proper on-site wastewater treatment unit. However, uh, right now, uh, as you can see in this figure, approximately 85% of the, uh, or the majority of the on-site wastewater treatment uh, system or the septic tank are actually Uh, how people are building their septic tank at their home. So uh, this was uh, th this is actually the uh, cement ring system, or what we call a cesspool. It's a kind of wastewater uh, treatment system that can basically easily leak uh, wastewater into the environment, which means that it cannot actually treat wastewater to meet with the standards set by pollution control department. To fix the system, we then actually have two strategy. First uh, is to increase the number of central wastewater treatment plant, uh, which is already explained uh, by the colleague from the BUNA. Um, and the second is that we should actually uh, increase the efficiency somehow, uh, trying to steer people away from uh, making the cement ring cesspool or septic tank at their home. So uh, we thought about uh, finding a way to induce people uh, for uh, for homeowner to install a proper on-site system unit. And we think that the energy efficiency sticker, or actually if you uh, know in Thailand, we call a number five sticker program, is one of the most successful program that help consumer uh, buy a more energy efficient product, uh, 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 which is this kind of program. We actually uh, think that it might be a good idea. We can replicate the successfulness of uh, this kind of program. So we are trying to basically make an environmental sticker uh, program, which we call a high treatment efficiency level, which can help manufacturer of the on-site treatment unit or septic tank to classify efficiency of the unit, uh, very similar to uh, energy efficiency sticker. So our level has ranged from one to five, but we are not forcing people uh, to just use the number five. For most of the case, number one or number two, should be better than the current cement ring system. But we are hoping that if the program is very successful, just like the number five program for uh, consumer, uh, consumer product, uh, 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 most of the people will eventually want to install the number five system. So we began by working with the Thailand Industrial Standard Institute to set up a T, uh, TIS or uh, uh, Industrial Standard for Thailand for package wastewater treatment tank for, uh, this is for residential building. So uh, right now we already announced, uh, the TISI has already announced the TIS 2962-2562 uh, standard, which require that uh, the tank will be tested by testing site uh, certified by TISI. So one of the criteria for obtaining uh, this level is that the tank should pass the treatment efficiency test uh, similar to the system made by uh, TISI and currently uh, most of the manufacturer of the septic tank are sending their product to test, uh, with, uh, uh, which will uh, take about a year to complete. So PCD right now is setting up a team uh, for proposing the criteria for uh, such a level of uh, this uh, sticker to paste on the septic tank. Uh, so, and we are working with the related government agency uh, to, uh, so that we can uh, basically promote the program right after the uh, uh, majority of the pro product uh, in the market has finished the testing with the, with the testing site. So uh, we are hoping that after probably a year from now, uh, when the uh, septic tank has been uh, passed the test with the testing site, we can begin to uh, advertise about uh, our sticker program and then uh, attracting co uh, consumer to buy uh, the, uh, the system that we uh, can hope that it will steer people away from using the uh, cement ring system uh, right now and then uh, 
reduce the number of the wastewater that actually flow into the uh, our river system. So th this is uh, for my first part. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Chayoui. This is a great overview. Um, I love this infographic showing um, how the program will work, what the what the problem is. It's it's really great to see. Um, you know, really interesting to hear about how you're starting this as a voluntary program. And I understand also not to put undue burden on households, you know, or try to, uh, you know, phasing some of the introduction here and using incentives and consumer information, um, which shows how powerful that can be. So um, really great to hear about that, that program that you're planning. Um, now we're going to turn to Kun Wipa from the Department of Health for um, her to give us a bit of an insight into um, what the Department of Health is doing on, on sanitation and her work. So Kun Wipa, um, could you tell us about how your, your department identifies and responds to sanitation needs in poor and remote communities? And just to, again, remind everybody to please choose the language that you would like to listen in as Kun Wipa will be อ่าในเรื่องของบทบาทของโรงพยาบาลนี่นะคะกรมอนามัยเนี่ยum, to give a better quality of life. Uh, so we 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 have the, uh, to promote in all kind of age. But when we talk of uh, the needy or the vulnerable or marginalized, um, our department really give emphasis of uh, these groups. And we have uh, set up um, offices uh, from the um, in environmental friendly offices or even on the food and sanitary on environment or, or even uh, to the mar marginalized group so uh, the objective is to give a uh, better quality of life of um, of the people Um, uh, in terms of the phacal sludge uh, treatment. And we also talk about um, uh, uh, toilets in households, toilets and public toilets. Um, we have been campaigning and advocate uh, to have toilets in every household and then, and then public um, toilets to uh, improve according to the standards. And in terms of phaco sludge management, so that it will not be detrimental to um, uh, health of the population. And we also uh, try to push with the regulations uh, uh, within, so that um, to have um, in accordance with the law. When we talk of a toilet households, approximately 99.8% that have household uh, toilets, but there are still 50,000 uh, households that doesn't have um, uh, the toilets yet, approximately 1.2%. And we are planning to push for this initiative so that everyone can access to all toilet household and definitely try to meet uh, uh, SDG uh, 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 target 6.2. Uh, uh, this is what I'd like to um, give a brief overview. Hope this helps. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Kun Wipa. That's uh, uh, fantastic. And um, really great to, to learn more about how clearly you've identified these 50,000 households 
um, and this emphasis of, uh, of the Department of Health, you know, really on reaching the poor and marginalized communities and improving their quality of life, which you said, which is so important. So um, thank you very much. Now we're gonna take a minute to turn from Thailand to the broader regional perspective with our next panelist. Um, and that is Mike White from the Asian Development Bank. So Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we've heard now about a lot of the steps that are being taken here in Thailand to reach vulnerable groups and to extend safely managed services to all. And we'd really like to learn from some of your experiences um, in the region, so many decades of experiences, um, as well as from some of ADB's work on uh, how ADB is supporting governments um, in the Asia Pacific region to be able to reach everyone uh, equitably. So over to you, Mike. Okay, thank you. Mike, I think you're muted. Sorry for that. Oh, I thought I clicked it already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks very much, Brooke. Um, and good afternoon to, to everybody on the call today. Um, so what, what's ADB uh, doing to support governments? So a little bit of background, I suppose. Um, as, as a multilateral development bank, ADB provides technical assistance, grants, and loans for sanitation planning and development, capacity development, and institutional reform and infrastructure provision. Um, planning and development is normally covered through our technical assistance, which is normally provided on a, on a, a grant basis, either to support uh, project planning and project development, or to provide support for capacity development and uh, institutional reform. Now for, for infrastructure provision grants, those grants for eligible countries, of course, um, uh, grants and loans are provided, which also uh, finance consultant support and capacity development. So, <clears throat> One of the issues we have is while water supply is normally a high priority for governments, most often sanitation is not. And only in recent years has interest been growing in sanitation sector. Uh, unfortunately, a sort of a good understanding of sanitation solutions is often lacking in developing countries and centralized sewage systems are the normal request for assistance from governments and is often a, an uphill struggle uh, for us to change mindsets. Um, and so there's a lot of convincing to, to be done uh, with the governments in, in many of our countries. Um, but I think, as we all know, uh, while centralized sewerage is likely to be the best long term solution for most cities and towns, it does have a number of drawbacks, which include, you know, significant capital costs, often requiring um, staged multiple projects over extended periods of time, um, significant and long term disruption you know, for digging up roads, et cetera, uh, high operational maintenance costs. And uh, a big issue is, is we see is often the uh, sewer connections to households, um, especially in densely populated areas. Uh, so, you know, in, in such areas, it diff often difficult to establish uh, sewerage systems. Also, if we look at how long it takes, you know, citywide implementation typically takes 20 to 30 years to complete, uh, and for big cities, even longer. Um, so it takes a long time for the majority of the population to actually see any real service. So reaching the last mile is rarely achieved. So while ADB has been trying to raise awareness with governments about alternative solutions in terms of sanitation planning, strategies, and solutions, it's often a slow process to realize those changes. So what is ADB doing to, to speed up the process and understanding? Well, well firstly, um, we've been doing a lot of um, work on, on sanitation projects that we do have to incorporate sanitation for all. 
However, it's it hasn't been enough, and it's not it's not there's not a standard approach that's been adopted really across the development partners. So in October 2018, ADB, along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and leading bilateral and multilateral development banks, met in Tokyo to discuss sanitation and in particular. Uh, uh, citywide inclusive sanitation and how to deliver um, sanitation for all um, in the in the quickest possible way. So out of this meeting came the decision to actively promote and apply the citywide inclusive sanitation approach to expedite sanitation provision. So what 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 difference did uh, is there with citywide inclusive sanitation? Well. Um, firstly, if we just summarize it quickly, it, it allows us to map out the sanitation needs of a town or city and marry this to a sanitation plan using a variety of technical solutions um, that can most quickly deliver sanitation for all. So uh, citywide inclusive sanitation also has a high degree of community consultation to ensure that appropriate solutions are provided and most importantly that those solutions are accepted um, no point in providing things and they're not used so typically you know the cwis uh, results in sh uh, in short medium and long-term approaches being developed short term is based on solutions to provide services to all under a single project intervention while a long-term um, long-term approach is focused on where the town or city wants to be in say 20, 30, 20, 30 even 40 years time. So, you know, there's a clear difference in, in okay, short term, we have to get everybody serviced. Uh, long-term is how do you want to do it sustainably, you know, for, for, for the very long term. And medium term is that transitional approach to get to the long-term goal. So we need to be thinking, uh, as well as delivering sanitation for all, we need to be delivering um, basically against a plan, which is where we want to be uh, in the future. <clears throat> so while ADB has been providing um, support for sanitation for, for all on many of its current projects, since 2019, the uh, citywide inclusive sanitation approach is now being formally applied to all new sanitation projects so that it becomes a standard approach. Um, and in Southeast Asia, we are looking, we have or are looking at um, citywide inclusive sanit sanitation projects in Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Philippines, and Vietnam. Um, and however, this is all well and good um, as in terms of an approach to deliver sanitation for all for, for in the urban environment for cities and towns. But what about rural areas where resources are more scarce and traditional sewerage approaches are unworkable and not even economically viable? In addition, in these locations, sanitation and hygiene awareness is often very low. The other thing to remember, which I always bring up with uh, the Gates Foundation, is to understand that, you know, while the world is urbanizing, that across the world, if you take an average, 50% of the world's population is still rural. If we look uh, at Cambodia, for instance, the rural population is still, you know, um, uh, in excess of 70%. So we have to really, if we're talking about the, you know, the um, development goals, uh, we, we need to start looking and taking more seriously what happens in, in, the, in the rural areas as well as urban. So uh, as an example, I mean, I just look at uh, Cambodia, which I, I've done a lot of work in. Um, ADB has been working with the government in, in in provinces surrounding the Tonle Sap Lake since 2006 to support rural water supply and sanitation at commune and village level. Now, the sort of infrastructure we're talking about there is basically either community-based or household-based. So it doesn't really lend to our typical urban lending portfolio. 
However, you know, the, the support has, has provided, was provided through two grants, uh, one of 18 million in 2006 and one of 21 million in 2010 to support development of rural water supply and sanitation in these uh, provinces. So, however, in 2016, when the country was no longer eligible for grants, we were able to negotiate a $15 million loan with the government to support the continuation of the sector development. And, and that's a little bit of a first, really, in the fact that because governments don't often borrow for rural water supply and sanitation. Uh, very good for borrowing for urban, um, but for rural, it's very difficult. So. And based on this, I think in 2019, um, ADB approved a $50 million loan to support rural water supply and sanitation sector in both in terms of infrastructure and also institutional reform so that, you know, the country's their decentralization um, process could, could be uh, enacted. Um, but a couple of uh, additional things of, you know, we know about household sanitation and providing water supply, but, uh, you know, there's a couple of interesting th things we did um, through a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant to look into designs and conduct large scale pilot testing for um, fecal sludge collection, transport and treatment and reuse at village level for, you know, basically the sustainable treatment um, uh, of households already provided with latrines. Because, okay, they've got the latrines, but, you know, they still need to be emptied every now and then. So we were looking at ways that we can collect them sustainably, safely, transport them, treat it, and reuse to provide, you know, either biogas or, or composting for, for local use within the village. Um, the other thing where we're looking at a slightly different uh, last mile, I suppose, is um, the fecal sludge collection and management for a boat based communities on the Tongle Sap Lake, where they have no land and no access to appropriate sanitation. So it was really had to look at something quite different uh, with that. And so we came up with a, 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 a several solutions. And then uh, as with the, comp uh, with the fecal sludge collection, uh, we, we did um, provided sort of large scale pilot testing. Because the important thing is, whilst we know all of the, the solutions will work technically, will they be accepted by the people using them? And if not, it's, it's a waste of time to provide this. So we wanted to get real feedback um, on, um, from the boat-based communities and the land-based villages on these new things to make their lives, improve their lives and also make sustainable, so sanitation more sustainable. So um, that was just a, a snippet of some of the things we're doing at ADB. I mean, we could talk, I could talk for many hours, but uh, I'm sure I'll bore all of you <laughs> if I do that. So um, I'll, that will be it for me now, uh, Brooke. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. I think all of the rich experiences um, from ADB's perspective really shine through and also your passion for sanitation. So I think the points of advocacy um, with governments to encourage lending for sanitation, borrowing for sanitation, both um, for urban and rural, making approaches like citywide inclusive sanitation um, be standard. Um, you know, looking at that mix of short-term and long-term planning and ensuring that rural areas are not left behind with some very creative solutions for, um, you know, FSM in, in uh, rural areas and even boat-based sanitation, which maybe we can hear more about later if there's, if there's time. So thank you very much. We have a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, and, and I have a couple of additional questions for everyone too, based on what you've just said on the panel. So maybe let's go back to Kun Suchai from the Wastewater Management Authority. Um, Kun Suchai, you had a question in the chat box from a participant about the costs and also the responsibilities for O&M. And in addition, I wondered if you could tell us about some of the aspects um, of your work on engaging the public and ensuring that your operations are um, green or eco-efficient. So Kun Suchai, over to you for some of your thoughts on that. And I think maybe my colleague Kim can share uh, some slides for you to speak to. Thank you very much, Kun Brook. And um, please go to my slides presentation.
Next, please. So we uh, provide public participation through our life cycle of wastewater management. Next slide, please. Starting from design and uh, operation and maintenance, and also the satisfaction uh, evaluation. For the design, for, uh, as my previous presentation, I mentioned that we use underground treatment for our man, uh, wastewater uh, system construction. And um, during the design process, we conduct um, public hearing and meeting with uh, local uh, people and also key stakeholders um, to let them make decision the land use above the underground system. And I, it's uh, up to them whether they would like to use uh, the above ground as playground, um, uh, soccer field or golf course, for example. And um, we also promote the on-site treatment for the household or commodity nearby the canal that the uh, central collection system cannot reach. And we uh, currently we install the grease tap to help those areas to treat some of the um, wastewater for the operation and maintenance, we also conduct site visit and a study tour for interested group, including uh, local uh, community uh, students and other uh, official from other areas or uh, other um, uh, people from other areas as well. We also provide 10 wastewater learning centers throughout Thailand. And lastly, we uh, conduct the surveys uh, to make sure that the community nearby and also uh, local uh, people and authority, for example, uh, key stakeholders involved in our management system, uh, uh, Certify with our services, and we use all of this data to approve our services uh, from time to time and year by year. And hopefully, um, they all can uh, give us good score for the improvement. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, eco efficiency or, or uh, green. Uh, uh, management. Next slide, please. We use the, uh, our strategy is the reuse of treated wastewater for farmers, for uh, industry in eastern part of Thailand. And uh, we construct construction the wetland for rural areas. And also we use solar cell uh, at our treatment plants. So next slide, please. For the solar cell, we use both uh, solar rooftop and also uh, solar floating system. Um, in order to reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emission, we use the program called ECAM, um, which is developed by the German International Corporation or GIZ, uh, which is online system at our center at the moment. And you, I can show you um, the figure on, on my slide. The, the amount of electricity consumption and the BOD uh, uh, level reduction would be calculated 
for the greenhouse gas emission under this uh, program. Next slide, please. For the eco-efficiency, uh, we calculated by the value of pro our product, which is the volume of treated wastewater to be reused, and also the environmental impact of the product, which is the effects on global warming, which uh, calculated by uh, as the kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalent. For our baseline uh, number, the our, our eco efficiency is about 0 0.193 uh, cubic meter per kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalent. Next slide, please. This, this is the picture that we use the solar roof in order to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emission and also reduce our uh, cost of operation because the electricity cost is about uh, 40 to 60 percent of our operation cost. Next slide, please. That's also the solar roof. And you can see the pond nearby. That's we are going to uh, start using uh, solar floating system by, uh, uh, by next year. Slide, please. Next slide, please. So that's our uh, the uh, clean energy plan. Uh, we use solar energy in all our uh, treatment process in the near future. And we hope that uh, our uh, cooperation corporate plan for the year 2020-2022, which is uh, will be which will be end by uh, next year. And this plan we also use green technology as well. Next slide, please. And in order to use uh, solar energy to generate electricity in the 50 year wastewater treatment project, including stabilization pond that I mentioned, we are going to use the uh, floating system. And we hope that uh, this uh, strategy will uh, help us to reduce the greenhouse gas emission and to improve uh, our cost effective and also improve our eco efficiency as well in the near future. And uh, in order to uh, answer the question that come from uh, the audience, uh, they would like to know the cost of operation and for uh, our cost of operation, including the um, main office. So we include all of the, the uh, expenditure from both main uh, our head office and also the uh, uh, regional offices. So it says at the moment is about 2.2 baht per cubic meter. Uh, that's our uh, the uh, uh, operation and maintenance costs. And if you have any other questions, feel free, feel free to ask so, or maybe can uh, contact us through our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kun Su Chai. Um, very comprehensive answers and great to see about the way that you involve the public through all stages of, um, of your work and um, also how your eco-friendly uh, initiatives have led to both the reuse of um, treated wastewater, as well as finding big efficiencies in uh, in your in your operations, um, and uh, finding alternative sources of energy using solar power. Um, so really impressive monitoring efforts, also on uh, on carbon emissions and, and other aspects of your program. So um, thank you very much for sharing those. I'm afraid that now we're out of time uh, for this really exciting panel. So I would like to thank all of the participants for sharing um, your, your questions in the chat box and thank all of our panelists 
um, for sharing your experiences and your insight on this really critical issue of reducing inequalities and reaching the last mile with safely managed sanitation services. Um, it's been a pleasure to learn more about what's happening here in Thailand, as well as across the region um, through the work of the Asian Development Bank and supporting um, your client, uh, client governments. So um, with that, uh, thank you very much again to all of our panelists, and I will turn it back over to my colleague Everest for our final session. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, very uh, fantastic panel, um, a very good discussion. Um, as we are Friday already, Friday people want to go home very quickly, but we have a very nice, a good session now to have a reflection on the four, uh, on the three days that we were together since the beginning. So um, uh, during this uh, reflection session, we have uh, three main, um, you know, speakers, three um, honorable speakers uh, will be talking to us in a different um, part of, of, of their work they are doing in different um, aspects. So um, the, the first one, the first uh, presenter we have is Mr. Shen Yushin, who is the director of Institute of uh, Rural Energy and Environmental Protection, uh, also Academy of uh, Agriculture Planning and Engineering, Minister of Agriculture in Rural Affairs in China. The second one is uh, Mr. Sasi Daran uh, Bela Yutam, who is the head of strategic operation and planning in the Wata Consortium Malaysia. And then uh, the third one uh, is uh, Mr. Jackson. You all know Jackson already. He's a founder of World Toilet Organization. And you know, just type, you know, Jackson, you see uh, the whole toilet, uh, how he bundled himself in toilet and something is very exciting. So thank you very much uh, to, for that. And uh, I'll give the floor to Mr. Shen very quickly for the first presentation, if you are there. Over to you, you have 10 minutes. Uh, when the time is coming closer, I will pop up in, in my video to tell you that you know we are close to, to wrap up. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfectly, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to attend the UNICEF regional meeting. My name is uh, Yu Jun Shen from AAPE from China. Uh, I also prepared some slides for the presentation. Okay, my topic is uh, present situation and the change of toilet renovation technology in rural of China. Uh, I will introduce four aspects. Okay, next slide, please. Next slides, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, four aspects, um, policy, technology problems and experience. Uh, the part one is the policy measures. Uh, as you know, the Chinese government attaches great importance to the rural toilet revolution and uh, formulate a series of policies. Health China 2030 planning outline issued in 2016 proposed that by 2030, rural residents in China will basically have access to harmless sanitary toilets. And then in 2018, three year action plan for rural living environment was issued, proposed that by 2020, uh, the last year in the eastern region and other areas with good conditions, the harmless renovation of rural toilets will be basically completed, completed and the feces will be effectively treated. In the western regions with good conditions, toilet renovation rate is about uh, 80, 85%. At the beginning of this year, the national number one document once again proposed to promote the rural toilets renovation and speed up the development of technologies and products for sanitary toilets in dry and cold areas. And then the remarkable results has been achieved in China. Next, please. Now, the 
Now the revolution rate has reached 68% in China. Okay, please, next. Okay, thank you. Has reached 68% in China. In Eastern region, exceeds uh, 90% and more than 30, more than 35 million rural household toilets have been renovated since 2018. Okay, the part, <laughs> yeah. Okay, the part two is the technology situation. I will introduce some uh, technology. Uh, they are very uh, uh, common in China. First, uh, I will introduce the flashing toilet with pipe network. Uh, this is very similar to the cities. This type is more common in the suburbs, uh, suburbs of large cities in China because of its close distance from urban and better economic uh, con uh, conditions. This is a terminal solution, but the construction investment is very high. Many places in China can't afford it. It's just in the uh, eastern part of China. And the second is the off-grid flushing toilet. And that's one, the off-grid flushing toilet. Like the three pictures, you can see that. Uh, the, the first is the three septic tanks. And the second is the double septic tanks. And the last is the biogas tanks. At present, these types are widely used in China. Uh, its advantages are less water consumption low cost of products and uh, construction. Uh, sorry. Sorry. And, and, and its advantages are less water consumption, low cost of products and uh, construction. It's a disadvantage is that it still needs further treatment of feces and the person, personal personnel are needed for operation. Uh, for other countries, I think this, uh, this kind of technologies can be applied to villages with warm climate, have land to spread the feces and uh, no pipe network. And the third one is the dry toilet. And next slide, please. Uh, yeah, it's the dry toilet, such as the double pit toilet and the separate collection toilet for the feces and the urine. Uh, these two, two kinds of types are used in Western and the Northeast China. It doesn't require water flushing and the cost is low. Uh, this technology is the best choice in water shortage areas, but this type always ha has a poor hygiene order harmless not completely and so on. Uh, next, please. In addition, there are some new technologies. First, uh, the anti first the anti-freezing technology in cold regions, yes, such as deep bare uh, buried, adding in solution uh, layer uh, layer and uh, external heating. And the second is the water saving technology in dry uh, regions, such as water free toilet and less water toilet and the self uh, circulating flushing toilet technology. These technologies are more and more applied in China. Uh, okay, in the part three, uh, I will give the problems of the technology in China. Also, we have the problems. I think the uh, the big problem is the unbalanced regional development. The renovation rate in the western and the northeast regions is, is not high. And uh, in some places, it's below 30%. Besides, the quality of some products is not good enough, easy to breakage and the leakage. In addition, long-term operation management and the maintenance do need attention. Uh, the last part, I will share some experience from China. I think the most important is the great importance by the government. 
the rural toilet revolution has been incorporated into the national strategy. Since 2018, China's central authority unveiled action plan to improve the rural living environment and set the goals of the rural toilet renovation. And second, I think the special funds have, have been set up for rural toilets. Uh, since 2019, China invested more than 27 billion RMB in the improvement of the toilets. And thirdly, the standards first. China has set up a professional stance com committee, uh, which is mainly undertaken by our academy. Uh, I am the secret secretary general of the committee. Now we are organizing a series of standards to guide toilet revolution. The first layer we have carried out lots of work like communications, uh, training, and uh, capacity building uh, to ensure smooth work. Government all levels organized the trainings of a toilet for official participants and uh, farmers to learn the basic knowledges and uh, policies. Uh, uh, this would improve their implication capacity. As a series of projects to solve the key problems, especially, especially for the dry and the cold uh, regions. Focus on present situation and the trend of technology of toilet renovation in rural China, I think we also have a long way to go. Okay, as the last, <laughs> I want to say, uh, we have published three illustrated books related to the toilets, uh, garbage, and the sewage. The next slide, please. Yes, these three books is we, uh, we have published. Uh, it, uh, uh, if you are interested in Chinese, uh, technology because it concluded uh, nearly all of the technologies about the toilet, the garbage, the sewage in this uh, book. We can translate into other language to share with you. Okay, that's all of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Chen. A very nice presentation uh, outlining a lot of uh, new technology, anti-freezing, water saving, um, toilet waste uh, um, uh, treatment also. We noted some of the challenge in terms of, uh, you know, quality of the product, but also we have, we know that there's a high uh, um, a commitment, political commitment. You talk about high premium commitment, which is very important, special form, which is fundamental. One quick question to you. Um, after the toilet revolution, what next? Sorry, uh, so um, please repeat the question. The question is after the toilet revolution, right? What is coming after? What do we have after the toilet revolution? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 as my uh, my presentation. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, although we have uh, achieved remarkable re, uh, results from the revolu uh, toilet revolution, but uh, we have a long way to go. Especially, I think, uh, uh, at the dry and the cold areas, there's no water to fly, uh, uh, to flush, and uh, it's difficult to freeze in cold areas. So many, many difficulties uh, for the toilet uh, improvement in China. Uh, although China, we have uh, imploring research and the development, there are no material technique products and the president. Uh, therefore, the next step, I think, uh, we will focus the te technology for the uh, dry and the cold areas. Uh, I think uh, the next uh, several years, uh, for China, the uh, for the dry and cold areas, the technology will be have a, a good uh, uh, advance. 
Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then there's a few questions for you on the chat box. We all love to have uh, all those books and translate in English so that also we can make available to many other countries. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chen, you. for your you. uh, intervention. Very much appreciate. So the next presentation, uh, Kim, the next slide. The next presentation that is coming from is from um, uh, Mr. Sassi Dahan uh, Velantudam. If I pronounce very well, uh, forgive yes. me if I pronounce very badly, but I think yes. you are welcome for the next presentation. Over to you, 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Everest, and uh, warm greetings from Malaysia to all the participants and the organizers. Uh, firstly, also thank you to the organizers for giving us the opportunity to give a reflection of the uh, sanitation services in Malaysia. Uh, can I have the next slide? Uh, Malaysia uh, had a vision. Uh, our vision was set in 1991, whereby by 2020, we wanted to become the high income nation and a developed country uh, by 2020. But as all of us know that we had a atypical uh, uh, situation in 2020, and that has actually uh, thrown the whole uh, thing into disarray. Uh, nevertheless, uh, going back to our vision, uh, the government realized that uh, in order to become a high income nation, that public health and uninterrupted supply of quality water uh, are in important enablers uh, to achieve the developed country nation. And related to that, sewerage management in Malaysia uh, had to be strengthened and uh, enhanced. So in 1993, the government of uh, Malaysia decided to federalize and privatize sewerage management in Malaysia with an intent to manage the sewerage services in the whole country through a single entity at the federal level. Uh, this is not very common in most countries, where in most countries, these are managed under the local government or local municipalities. So we took a very challenging and very uh, unconventional uh, part uh, in this regards. So IWK as a company was established in 1994 uh, as the National Sewerage Services Company. Uh, it was a private company and uh, we were tasked to actually take over all the sewerage systems from the local government or local municipalities under the company. So we were responsible for operations and maintenance of the sewerage facilities, carry out scheduled uh, disluging of septic tanks, and also uh, provide uh, responsive services on sewerage matters. In addition to that, uh, we were also required to upgrade and refurbish existing uh, sewage uh, facilities and construct new sewage facilities. Now, during that period, we realized that this is a very burdensome task to be carried out. Uh, besides focusing on operations maintenance, we also need to do capex development to bring about new development of sewage infrastructure in the country. So in 20 by 2000, in year 2000, that means about seven years after the privatization, IWK was, became uh, what we call as the government-owned company. And we, but we still existed as a private company. But the burden has not been relieved yet. So the government then came up with a new act called a Water Services Industry Act uh, in 2007. So with the enforcement of the act, IWK was relieved from the CapEx obligation. As such as to refurbish, to upgrade, and construct new plants. So what happened to IWK? We became uh, solely an operations and maintenance company, focusing on uh, delivery of services to the public. And we, we call ourselves uh, becoming a, what we call as an asset light uh, model uh, business. Yeah? So with this development of infrastructure uh, and uh, of wastewater treatment plant uh, taken over by the government uh, and the private, uh, private developers, so we, we, as I said, we focus more on the uh, delivery of the uh, sewerage services to the public in the country. Uh, can I have the next slide? So in terms of uh, sewerage uh, uh, systems in Malaysia, there are two types of uh, uh, systems, which is connector system and septic tank systems. Connector systems, as we all of us know, refers to sewerage connection to sewage tumor plant. So presently, we operate more than 6,800 plants throughout the country, of which 190 are uh, regional plants with capacity more than 50,000 uh, population equivalent, or we call it PE. Our largest plant is in Kuala Lumpur, which is serving about 1.4 million population equivalent. 
We also uh, take care of more than 1,200 uh, network pumping stations and uh, more than about close to 20,000 kilometers of sewer pipelines. In total, we treat about 26 million uh, uh, wastewater from 26 million population equivalent. Uh, besides connected systems, uh, we also have pockets uh, of, uh, and, uh, of uh, areas with septic tanks, uh, both communal and individual types within our operations area with a combined PE of 6.7 million. So there are also about 3 million people in this country using uh, port, port flush pit latrines. Yeah. Next slide. Now with this uh, background, uh, I, I, appreciate, I, I believe you would have appreciated that we have two types of systems connected and septic tank distillation services. In terms of, in terms of the statistics, uh, today, almost 100% of public in Malaysia have access to basic sanitations. Yeah? And uh, wastewater from 79% of the people uh, population is connected to some form of centralized wastewater treatment facilities. And 20% uh, is to on-site facilities such as septic tanks and uh, pore flush uh, pit latrines. Now, open defecation is unheard of anymore in Malaysia. If any, it could be in a very remote interior areas like in Sabah or Sarawak. Now, in terms of public health, waterborne epidemic is no longer common uh, in Malaysia. Only one in 100,000 people uh, come down with such disease uh, in a year. Now, we, uh, however, uh, if you notice, uh, there is a figure there standing out, 89%. Now, this 89% refers to uh, in terms of safely managed sanitation system. Now, we seem to be lacking here, we agree. Now, this gap is largely due to very few of the septic tanks in the country are being dislodged regularly. Now, before 2007, before the, uh, the Act, Water Service Industry Act was uh, enforced, about 30% of the septic tanks used to be dislodged regularly every year. But after the Act was enforced, <laughs> regretly, the number dipped to below 10%. The reason being is the Act has been enforced in a such a way that the responsibility to be the septic tank to be dislodged was transferred the, to, the, to the public. Yeah? The public has to make a call to request for dislodging services. It's no more uh, very compelling for them to dislodge. Therefore, the number dropped to 10% currently. Yeah? So basically, uh, there are many factors, and I personally think the main one is people still do not see there is a need to have their septic tank dislodged. Uh, when they have their internal sanitation systems working perfectly for them. Yeah? So basically, there is a lack of appreciation and awareness uh, for sanitation and environment, uh, even in Malaysia uh, today. Yeah? So our challenge uh, is actually to get the septic tank to be dislodged. And this year, in 2021, in the crisis of pandemic and so on, the government still have managed to successfully enroll, to roll out uh, a new regulations, a regulations called septic tank dislodging regulations. And these regulations is enforced from, in fact, from June onwards, this month onwards, where it requires the public with septic tanks to have their septic tank to be dislodged once in every two years, failing of which they will be penalized. And there is some penalty clauses in the regulations. And IWK has been entrusted to carry out scheduled dislodging of septic tanks for this uh, people. And we are supposed to issue dislodging notices to 1.3 million people every year to get their septic tank to be dislodged. Right? Now, in terms of financing, I heard there is an interest in terms of to understand the financing of sewerage, provision of sewerage services in this country. Now, the cost of OPEX for operating and uh, expenditure for the asset is recovered through customer billing. The billing is based on tariff regulated by the government. And we have different tariff for domestic, commercial, industrial, and government institutions. And the tariff also differs for a connected services compared to the dislodging services. For dislodging services, the tariff is only about US dollars 140 uh, per month. Whereas for a connected services, the tariff is US dollar two per month. You know? Now, by now you would have appreciated that we have one of the lowest storage tariff in the world. The tariff is supposed to be revised uh, every, uh, according to the concession agreement by the government. 
but until today we have yet to, re to receive a revision uh, and we are still using a tariff that is set in 1994. So this is also another challenge. So therefore IWK as a government owned company, but still existing as a private entity, we need to continuously innovate our way of doing things. Balancing the need to meet environmental requirement and at the same time doing the work in a very cost efficient way so that we are able to provide sustainable sewage services to our people with some support from the government still. Now, as for the capex for infrastructure development, this is entirely borne by the government or by the private developers. Right? Next slide. Now, these are this a list of uh, key takeaways uh, for you to appreciate. Uh, but in a summary, uh, in Malaysia, sewerage infrastructure development is still ongoing, basically to increase the connected sewer systems to upgrade and refurbish existing infrastructure and to rationalize and close down small sewage treatment plants to regional uh, centralized systems. As you know just now, we have more than 6,000 plants in the country, which is huge number in any, uh, in any places. So in addition to this, the private sector support is always there to create new sewage systems for new areas open for development. As this is progressing, uh, IWK as the national sewerage operators, we focus on delivery of sewerage services to the public. And this model could be one of the very few unique one in the world, I believe, where a company at national le level delivers sewerage services for almost the entire country. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, thank you very much uh, for a very nice presentation. Um, and um, I, I'm enjoying basically listening to you and also, um, you know, knowing that, you know, you have gone through a huge reform uh, in the country before you get there. And also now there's some, some of the challenge uh, in terms of tariff that you are facing. Um, one quick question for you. Um, if you basically want one thing to change, what would be the one thing? I think, uh, you know, this uh, sewage services is still not, is, is, is something is not seen. People do not see the services like the water supply or electricity and so on. So there is still what we need to do is create massive awareness program throughout the country continuously. It's not a one-off thing that we need to do and stop. No, sewage services awareness program throughout the community, throughout the public need to be continuous effort to be done so that people appreciate the services, carry out the obligations to get the septic tank discharged, And at the same time, they need to make sure they pay the sewerage bills because we do not have a means to cut off the sewerage services, unlike water supply. You know? This is thank one, you very much. one thing. Yeah. No, thank you very much. It's the same question someone is asking in, uh, in the chat box. Say, can you explain how the tariff of sewage system are collected in Malaysia? Is yes. it the part of uh, the annual taxes or what is it collected? Yeah, those days when the, the sewage services used to be under the local government, uh, the public actually pay as part of their tax assessment for the property. But once it's taken over by IWK and federalized uh, under the national government, uh, the sewage services is paid through bills. So we issue bills, uh, supposed to be a monthly bill, but it was changed to a quarterly bill for domestic uh, households. Whereas for commercial and government institutions and industrial, we build them on a monthly basis. So, and then they are supposed to pay by different, different modes. Either they bank in or they can walk into the customer uh, counter service centers and so on. Okay, thank you very much. This additional question in the chat box, you can answer directly for the chat box if you have some okay. time. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mrs. Asidaran. It's a thank very you. nice presentation. Uh, very good, you know, uh, high level uh, to the point, and then we learn a lot uh, what you are doing also in Malaysia, and we look forward to working together with you as well in the near future. Thank, Thank you. you again. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the next, the next reflection that we are having is from Jackson, uh, Professor Jackson. Most of you, you know Jackson, right? You see, you just Google, go to the, you know, YouTube. You say Jackson, it will appear. Right uh, in the toilet, in a, you know, on the toilet paper everywhere, you know, you can see Jackson. Okay, Jackson. After the three days uh, of this meeting, uh, you have been the first day, second day, and then now you are in the whole uh, third day as well. So, what are your reflection 
uh, you know, uh, based on what you have seen and how do you create a massive transformation um, movement on, on toilet? Uh, we want to hear from you. Over. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So I created the, the Sanitary World Toilet Organization because the subject of shit it's very, very uncomfortable in the year 2001. So the entire development uh, community call it a water agenda. And when I saw that when they call it the water agenda, it means that they are not going to talk about toilets. They are going to talk about water. They're not going to talk about hygiene. And then I asked them, why is it that you don't say it? They say, if I say water and sanitation, after a while, the short form is water. And if I say sanitation, there's no funding. I cannot raise money, so I don't want to talk about it. And so it became a very neglected subject. And what we don't discuss, we cannot improve. So we created this organization with the acronym WTO. And my evil plan was to hope that the World Trade Organization will sue me so that sanitation will be on center stage of media. Strangely, the World Trade Organization didn't sue me, but the media loved this WTO, the second WTO, which is toilet. And so they start to report so much about it that uh, 13 years later, our founding day, the 19th of November, became known as the UN World Toilet Day. And so I will tell you this story. Next slide. Uh, when we break the taboo, the WTO name is a very nice leverage, but it also comes with photograph like this one. And so I have to make myself look very humorous, not because I am a clown, but because for the communication, humor breaks the taboo on sanitation. If I'm going to talk seriously, like some professor, they will call it fecal sludge management. And the media will not report it because this is not the layman language, right? So you see me here sitting on the throne with a with a scepter, which is a plunger. Right? Next. Through the process, we are able to engage very high level. Every year we have World Toilet Summit starting first year in Singapore, then in Korea with the mayor of Suwon City, then in Taiwan, then in China, in Beijing in 2004 to prepare for the Olympics. Big World Toilet Summit just to prepare for the 2008 Olympics. And the Olympics in China was a success because the sanitation situation in Beijing was not a failure. Because if the toilet was dirty, all the visitors will go home and say, oh, Chinese toilets are very dirty. But it was very clean during the time of the Olympics. But after that, the legacy continued and Chinese toilet revolution followed recently and all the tourism toilet became very, very clean. I was so impressed with China and now rural toilet. Next slide, please. That is the president, Abdul Kalam, and six minister opening World Toilet Summit. And then the crown prince of the Netherlands, Prince of Orange, uh, William Alexander. And, and he is now the king. And, and we are very good friends because we both want to solve the sanitation crisis. So as I work as an NGO that is very small, but by storytelling, the image of the World Toilet Organization story became very, very large and supported by very, very high level people. Next slide, please. Eventually, it got the attention of Bill Gates. He was focusing on health, but he realized that preventing the disease is even cheaper than curing the disease. And 50% of all developing countries' hospital bed are caused by waterborne diseases and very much caused by 
fecal contamination in water. So he invested $200 million on reinventing the toilet. Now it's called reinvented toilet. And uh, some of the technology are useful, not all of them, because too many are gimmicky. But I think it is very important that the big philanthropists pay attention to sanitation. And he also created, uh, contributed to the movement where everybody else joined in to donate money for sanitation. Next slide. Then President Clinton came to support our work and uh, created a fundraising commitment, which we raised $1.3 million. And this is uh, very interesting because by telling the story and become the voice of sanitation globally, all the other people start to join in to support and it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Next slide. Then I went to the United Nations to lobby 193 countries ambassador. So we have to give speeches, we have to do um, this uh, reception, lunch, coffee, each one, either a group or privately, and we explain to them why we need to make the World Toilet Day which is our founding day of the World Toilet Organization, an official UN day. And they were attracted because every year, we already have two and a half billion readership and audience on World Toilet Day. So it is quite natural that the endorsement is a mutual endorsement because this UN day is already popular and now it become official. So. After that, next slide, please. We get a unanimous vote of 193 governments. All the members of the UN General Assembly declare that 19 November is UN World Toilet Day. And when that happened, nowadays, every country is celebrating it, making policy announcement there, publishing a uh, state of sanitation report like last year unicef published it at our world toilet summit and so as this movement become official it becomes structural and for me it's very gratifying because within a lifetime to be able to create a legacy that is continuous and taken over by everybody this is very very fulfilling right next President Xi Jinping, as explained by uh, Speaker uh, Yujun Shen, she, uh, the President Xi Jinping has created a toilet revolution in China. So we see that the two biggest country in the world, India and China, both leaders are toilet champion. This is so gratifying. And, and so we started to build rainbow school toilet in China. And this is rural toilet, and we teach the children to take care of the toilet, to clean it themselves. And the toilet stays very clean because the students create a culture of making sure they don't dirty so that the next class will not have to clean too much. So we created this very good culture internally. And we built 15 rainbow school toilets in the Henan and Guangxi region. And now we want to hand it over to the Ministry of Education for 214,000 uh, schools in rural area. Next. Prime Minister Modi uh, launched the Swatch Bharat campaign and built 110 million toilets. And, and he came to Singapore to have this appreciation photograph for our support. And the, publicity, bring along Bollywood stars and, and a global citizen with 80,000 uh, audience performed by Jay-Z, Coldplay, Shah Rukh Khan, Amitabh Bachchan, everybody. So these are the kind of publicity that we are able to trigger, to mobilize. And I hope that the toilets that are built in India will have to be used because right now the challenge in India is that 
the toilet is built, but it may not be used as the toilet, it might be used as a storeroom or something like that. So there is still a lot of cultural demand drive for toilet that we need to work on. Next. So in India, in the Aurangabad, which is the Maharashtra Strait, we built a World Toilet College with a sponsorship from Hapit. And now we are going to build a series of five World Toilet College. And we would like to build World Toilet College in any country. If anyone listening to this talk wants to uh, build World Toilet College, please contact me. We can uh, work with you. And we train right now 7,500 professional toilet cleaners and sanitation worker and also we place them into job not we just recruit them unemployed train them and place them into professional job with good reasonable salary so this is a process that is very sustainable because the people the hospital the shopping center the the uh, officers they also want our workers next so in a summary, I want to say, how do you create a global movement? First, we start with powerful storytelling and humor in this case was employed and it works magic. So everybody talks about it. You will watch out this year, 19 November, the World Toilet Day campaign will be even more bizarre. We are walking around naked or with a printed t-shirt not our body naked, but the nakedness is printed on the T-shirt. And this is very interesting. Uh, uh, we, we are printing the butt of the person on the T-shirt. Right? The other is that once you are able to control the media coverage, the politician will join you because the politician wants the media popularity to win votes and power. After the politician join in, the public policy people will join in because they listen to the politician and they will allocate uh, funds on cost benefit analysis. Prevention is cheaper than cure. Then the academia, they already have publication. They will be able to dig out all these publications and we help them create more awareness of this readership for their publication. The celebrities comes to spice up and the donor donate because now it's high visibility and the NGO come and collect the donation and everybody gets toilet. So can you see by telling story, you can create this whole chain reaction. Next. So thank you very much. This is a sample of how we communicate with uh, turning the 007 upside down and call it Lou. And uh, please contact me, here's my email. And please remember to celebrate uh, World Toilet Day, 19th of November. Thank you yeah, very thank much. You very, thank you very much, Jack Sim. Uh, Sim. Um, Jack Sim. It's very, very good to see how the whole um, Toilet Day evolved and all the effort you have done in different countries. The two biggest countries, India and China, how things have changed tremendously. And, um, and also see all the progress and the whole structure way that you are addressing things. Um, very quick question to you, very challenging question to you. Uh, Jackson, if you want to do things differently, what will you do? You have to look for the problem and then you look for the people who will benefit from the problem. And if you can align the benefit of the people, you will also be able to mobilize them to contribute to the solution because once they join the solution they take away their benefit just like a politician join the solution promise toilet and win election so uh, if the media join you they win publicity readership more advertisement so one example uh, in 2019 we lobby in brazil at the world toilet summit in sao paulo we love it that because 50% of all the sewerage in Brazil is not treated, they go to the beaches, the sea, the river, and it's very, very pollutive. So we went to the Senate and we lobby, and then everybody come to World Toilet Summit and launch a bill to arrive, 
allow PPP private public partnership into water plants in Brazil. After that, six months later, the bill was passed, and 13.3 billion dollars is now invested in Brazilian water plant for sewage treatment, and we target that when all of them are invested, it is $100 billion. So this is the kind of impact that policy nudges and the World Toilet Summit and the storytelling is so important using the media. Mm, thank you very much. And we have uh, a lot of young people uh, on the call today. Um, and then um, um, uh, many people are seeing the, in a chat box that it's a great, great job, Mr. Toilet. Uh, there's a lot of young people on the call today. And then we talk about World Toilet College, right? So what would be the advice you should be giving to the young people who are connected today on, on this call? So if you are young and you want to solve a problem, do not look at all the obstacles. There's a question here about failure disagreement don't worry about this you just decide to yourself that you want to solve this problem then whatever it takes to solve it you will solve it then in that case you open yourself to all possibility so whether you are talking to a company or a government or a civil servant or the media or a church go and do it in India, I become almost like a Hindu because I'm working with all the religious people. But then I go to the Vatican City, I behave like a Catholic. But actually, the truth is I have no religion. I have to work with people according to them. And do not go out there thinking that uh, if I have money, I will solve it. No, no. Money only follow after the idea, the plan, the passion is there. Don't worry about resources. Everybody is waiting to partner you if you believe in yourself and if you are committed to solve this problem, please join me because I will put my email here one more time and then if you have any idea, any question, you join me because I started not knowing much about toilets but I can do this, you also can do this. Because you also have a lot of experience using the toilet. I have now 64 years experience using the toilet. Maybe you have 20 years, but that's good enough. Okay, thank you very much. And then the last question for you, uh, which is very important. Um, what is your objective with uh, the World Toilet College? How many people you want to reach with the World Toilet College? I would like to have the World Toilet College in every major city in the world. And uh, if you want to build World Toilet College, there is so much knowledge we can all share. As long as you want to create it, we will give you the curriculum. We will partner you with the branding. We will help you with the media, everything. And then the recruitment and we create jobs because toilet cleaners and sewage workers are always treated as an unskilled worker. It's not true. This is a high skill. They are technicians. So we have to respect them to the level of a technician and pay them accordingly. So when you work, you work with pride, with good pay, and also good working condition. Thank you very much, Jaxim. Uh, very inspiring. Thank you for your time today. Uh, we really appreciate you coming in during uh, this reflection session. Uh, thank you very much and looking forward working together with you uh, in the near future. Thank you. So the next slide is more about, um, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the closing, uh, the closing side. Uh, I just want to, before I close, uh, because it's Friday, everyone needs to go as well. Um, I just want to thank everybody um, uh, since the beginning, since Wednesday, uh, on the different call uh, from day one till today, uh, who uh, contribute a lot in, in this uh, discussion. Thank for all your participation and also thank for all the organizers uh, who has been uh, behind and thank also for the presenters, uh, the quality of the presentation, the quality of your thoughts are uh, totally well appreciated and thank you very much for that. Um, 
And we have learned we have learned a lot during the past three days. An intense learning in terms of technology, in terms of process, in terms of how you do better, in terms of a way forward, and also um, learn more innovative approach, not only on technology side, but also on uh, on the soft side, like Jack Simon was talking about um, the, the, the college, the sanitation college, for example, is something that we learned as well, which is totally different. So we, you know, in, in the, over the past three days, we brought a lot of um, idea for solution in different aspects, innovations, and also system, sanitation system, citywide approach, uh, and, and different way. We talk about sustainability of sanitation services. Those are fundamental if you want to um, reach a million of underserved population uh, uh, who don't have uh, uh, who who are looking for sanitation services, and we don't need to forget as well that in the urban area we need to have uh, you know operation and maintenance service running as well to make sure that system services are very clean for many populations, uh, many people in that. So um, as a way forward, uh, this um, um, uh, uh, sanitation exposition has been a very big eye opener for us. Uh, and let's see also how the Thai uh, company are doing a lot of work in, in terms of developing new technology and outreaching a lot of country uh, in, in the region. We, we are looking forward working together with you as well. And we'll be sending to all the participants the proceeding, uh, the record, the information that you have gathered during uh, these three days. We're having a very short report that we'll be sharing with all of you. And then we're looking forward as well. We'll be looking forward as well, uh, reaching out to you uh, differently to see how we can basically team up and work together in different way. So with that, I would like to thank you very much on behalf of uh, AIT, uh, SCG, and then the Thai Chamber of Commerce. Thank you very much for all your participation and all your support during this event. And then I particularly the team here in, uh, in UNICEF and to me make sure that uh, making sure that everything works smoothly. Um, so um, our colleague are putting on the on the on the on the on the Zoom uh, a very quick evaluation for all of you. If you can just click on this evaluation and submit to us, it might be very helpful to help us to improve the way that we organize uh, each of the event and how we can basically focus on our interest into. Thank you very much for this. And uh, again, thank you uh, AIT, Dr. Tamarat, uh, um, Atawut, uh, Kuna Tawut, um, uh, Thai Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, and also uh, our team here, Brooke, uh, Ka uh, Mood, and uh, Kim, for all the support provided during this. Uh, uh, thank you very much and looking forward to, to the next to come. Please fill the form, uh, evaluation form showing there. And um, again, thank you, see you, keep safe, See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.